Welcome to Learn at Home with VIA. My name is Jennifer McKee. I'm a learning support teacher in the Jersey Shore Area School District. Today, we're going to look at the book, You Wouldn't Want to Be a Pyramid Builder, a hazardous job you'd rather not have. We have three essential questions we're going to answer. What job would you want to do on building a pyramid? What job would you want to avoid when building a pyramid? Why were the pyramids built? You Wouldn't Want to Be a Pyramid Builder was written by Jacqueline Morley. It's illustrated by David Antram. Introduction. You are living in Egypt around 1500 BC. How lucky you are. Other nations struggle to keep going, but Egypt is different. And so its people believe. Each year, as if by magic, Egypt's Nile River overflows its banks, watering the desert and dumping a belt of rich soil over the land. Without it, nothing would grow and everyone would starve. The Egyptians think the gods look after them because their rulers, the pharaohs, are gods themselves. When a pharaoh dies, he joins the hawk-headed sun god, Ra, Ra, and travels the sky in his boat. To make sure he lives forever, the pharaoh's corpse must not decay. So each pharaoh gets his subjects to build a gigantic tomb, a pyramid, which will preserve his body forever. Thousands of Egyptians are forced to work on it, including you. Scraping a living. Some people in Egypt are very rich. The pharaoh and his court, high-ranking officials, and wealthy landowners. But the majority are poor. Some make a living making things to sell, especially in the towns. Most people earn their keep by farming the land. As an ordinary Egyptian, that's what you do. You grow crops for a rich landowner, and in return, he lets you have a patch of land to grow things on to feed your family. You have to work hard for him and hard for yourself. What do you own? You don't have much in the way of possessions. Perhaps a pig, goat, and some geese. Your furniture is just a few stools, boxes, and storage jars. You sleep on a mat on the floor. Where do you live? You, your little house is built of bricks made of sun-baked mud. For eight months, you're hard at work, plowing, sowing, weeding, watering. It hardly ever rains. And harvesting. Then the Nile River comes. The Nile flood comes. For the rest of the year, you can't farm because the land is underwater. If you're expecting a rest, think again. So if we look at the bottom, tilling your own patch. If you are too poor to own an ox, you and your family will have to pull the plow yourselves which is our left picture. If you're really poor and don't even have a plow, you will have to dig your patch with a mattox, our right picture. Here's a handy hint at the top. Don't build your house on low ground or it will be underwater in the flood season. Officials, officials. The Pharaoh is all powerful. The Egyptian people think he is a god. He has a very efficient government that makes sure his commands are carried out, out throughout the land. His officials keep records of, the, of who lives where and how wealthy they are. They come around every year to check that the figures are up to date. Then they decide how much tax you pay, have to pay the Pharaoh. Since the ancient Egypt, Egyptians haven't, haven't invented money, you pay this by handing over things you have produced or by work on official projects. The biggest official project is the Pharaoh's Pyramid, which will take years to finish. With all those farm laborers sitting idle in the flood season, the Pharaoh doesn't have a problem finding workers. He sends his officials around the villages to call up people like you. What do you have to put up with? There are taxes. At the start of the season, officials assess your tax by measuring the area you allot to each crop in the current year. Problems? If your crop is poor that year or someone's cattle gets loose and eat it, you'll still have to pay the amount that's been assessed. Repairs? 
Before the flood comes, officials make you repair the canals that help keep the Nile's precious water from using for use throughout the year. The Pharaoh's ring is a stamp that is used as a way to mark his communication. Never argue with the tax inspectors. They always have ways of showing you your, how wrong you are. So why are the pyramids built? The pyramids are a tomb for the Pharaoh. If you notice, there's a hierarchy. At the top of the pyramid is the Pharaoh. In the middle are his officials, like the tax collectors. At the bottom are the farmers and other workers. When the Nile River floods, the farmers help build the pyramid. Pulling your weight. Now you're one of 4,000 people working on a pyramid, which could take 20 years to build. As an unskilled worker, your job is hauling blocks of stone from the quarry, where they're cut to where the masons are, wa to where the masons are waiting to set them in position. The pyramid is formed by layer upon layer of these blocks. Apart from the pharaoh's burial chamber and an entrance passage, the pyramid is solid stone throughout. It requires over two million blocks. Working in a gang of 20, you drag stone higher and higher as the pyramid grows. Around 35 gangs have to deliver a block every two minutes, so the overseers keep you working hard. You work from sunrise to sunset, sleeping in crowded barracks, and only getting one day off in 10. So if you look towards the middle, this is a giant statue of the Pharaoh that will be set up at the temple in his honor. 100, 100 men are needed to haul each one. If you look at the bottom, a watchful eye, the Pharaoh inspects the first stage of building. Getting the pyramid's enormous base Absolutely square and level is essential. Ways around a problem. The ancient Egyptians haven't invented wheeled vehicles. They used sledges to transport heavy objects, laying a temporary runway of smooth logs, made it easier to slide the sledge over the ground. So if you look at the handy tip, your sledge will move more smoothly if the log path is coated with mud, kept slippery, by you pouring water on it as you go. At the bottom. At this stage in the building process, the pyramid is steps sides. It is very hard to haul stone up these sides. So to, a temporary ramp was used, was built. It is not known exactly how this looked. And here are two possible way, possibilities of the different ramps to use to haul the stones up. Sent to the quarries. If you are handling, if you are handy with a mallet and chisel, you might find yourself in the stone quarries. The ones near the site provide stone for the pyramid's core. The fine limestone used for the outside surface comes from quarries east of the river. If you are sent there, you will be working underground since the best stone lies beneath the surface. You chip away at the top and sides and then split them free at the base with long wooden levers. It's backbreaking work, but not as grim as being sent to quarry granite in the far south of Egypt. It's boiling hot there, and you work in the open, trying to cut into very hard stone with a lump of start cutting into very hard rock with a lump of stone. Your tools include a wooden mallet, a stone-headed hammer, and chisels made of copper, which is the hardest metal available. The ancient Egyptians. I didn't invent an iron working. Here's your handy hint. To keep copper, to help copper saw stone, pour a sandy slurry into the cut. The quartz in the sand does the cutting. The blade applies, applies the pressure. Skilled stuff. Masons at work. At the top of the ramp, Teams of masons are putting the stones into position. This is a skilled job. If you are one of these workers, you won't be a conscript, 
but a trained full-time employee of the Pharaoh. As each block is delivered, it is checked for size and fit and levered into position with wooden rods. The outer casing blocks must fit together perfectly, but the masons must not take too long or there will be a pileup of blocks waiting to be set. When the last block, the pointed capstone is in place, the ramp will be demolished from the top down. Then the edges of each pyramid are trimmed and polished to form a continuous slope. The final piece. Setting the capstone in place is one of the trickiest jobs. There's not much room to maneuver. You need to watch your toes. Here's a handy hint. Don't work with a blunt chisel. There's a small army of full-time chisel sharpeners, roughly one to every hundred chisels. Jobs building the pyramid. You could go to the quarry to get the sandstone, get the stone or the limestone. Remember, one of those jobs is underground, the other job is in the hot sun. Then you have the masons. They're putting the stones into place. This is a skilled job. It sounds like it only gets hard at the top when there's not much room to work. Which of these jobs would you prefer? Why would you choose that job? Let's see if there's more jobs to explore when building pyramids. Scribes, scribes, scribes. Each day the amount of work you do is recorded in writing by a professional record keeper called the scribe. Many ordinary people do not know how to write, so being a scribe is good. There are scribes all over the site, keeping track of everything. The number of blocks delivered daily, the number laid, the tools issued in the morning, and the number handed in at the end. At the delivery of food supplies, the rations issued, the reason for anyone's absence, the cause of an accident or dispute. Their records enable the site officials to keep tight control on men and materials and if the work is on schedule. These officials report to their superiors, report to theirs on up the ranks, all the way to the Pharaoh. So if you look at the top here, in all official work, people report to their overseers. Scribes keep a record. The overseers report on the reports to their department heads. The department heads report to the vicer, who is the Pharaoh's chief minister. The vicer gives an update to the Pharaoh of what's happening at the pyramid site. Here's a handy hint. Don't try to borrow tools for your own use. You'll be searched if the records don't match. If you look in the middle, this is the writing kit. A scribe's Tools include an oblog case for the brushes he writes with, a cake of dried ink, and a place for water to moisten it. Carvers and painters. Would you like a job inside? It might be claustrophobic and spooky working by lamplight deep inside a mountain of stone. To qualify, you have to be highly skilled. The workers who decorate the pharaoh's burial chambers and funerary temple have had lengthy training. You need a sure hand to enlarge a complicated design to fill a large area of wall. You then carve away the background so that the figures are slightly raised. Finally, they are painted in their traditional colors. It is very important to know the exact stance and gestures the figures should portray and what symbols and written spells should accompany them. There are long established rules about this. If you get any of them wrong, the decorations will lose their magic power of ensuring the Pharaoh's safe journey to the gods. So if you look at the bottom, these are some of the carvings they made in the paintings. If you look in the middle, here's a typical pyramid. You really only have a little path in and the burial chambers for the Pharaoh. At the bottom, wall painters help transfer the design to the wall. Both are marked with a grid. If you're just a trainee, you'll be mixing the paint by grinding minerals to a powder, powder and adding egg whites or sticky tree resin. Here's a handy hint. 
If you're drawing a scene, don't try to be inventive. No one will be pleased. More of the usual is what is wanted. So here are some more jobs building the pyramid. You have scribes, which are professional record keepers who record everything. You also have overseers, department heads, and the vicer, who's the chief minister to the pharaoh. Other jobs include carvers and painters. These jobs are a little more skilled than the day laborer, such as the person working in the quarry. Home comforts. If you're a craftsman working full-time for the pharaoh, you'll be housed in a specially built town near the site. You and your family will have a small mud brick house with a couple of rooms for living and sleeping, a storeroom, and an outside cooking area at the back. Your quarters are cramped and bare. The floor is beaten earth and the windows are small and high up to keep out the sun's glare. There's no comfortable furniture. Food mainly coarse homemade bread, vegetables, and very little meat is served on low tables. Cooking is done over a fire made in a hole in the ground. Life in the town. And the town is protected by a wall with a gate that is guarded by day and, and shut at night. Most of the supplies the town needs are brought in on pack mules. Water has to be drawn from a reservoir outside of the town gate. Shopping without money needs bargaining skills. You pay in goods, notice bartering, and you try to use as few as possible. On payday, your wages come in a various useful forms, such as grain, oil, or fine linen cloth. Craftsmanship is handed down within families. You'll want to train your son to follow you. You look at the top. To keep away evil spirits, place the figure of the god, Bez, in a shrine set in the wall of one of your rooms. He protects the home. Staying on the right side of the gods. Ancient Egyptians believe that everything that happens in the world is controlled by the gods, so it is important not to offend them. You must bring offerings of your best produce to the temples for them. Every town has several large temples, each one the home of a god. Each pharaoh tries to outdo previous ones by building a bigger temple. Inside, priests care day and night for an image in which the god is thought to live. Ordinary people like you are not allowed inside the temples, but you know that when the crops fail or when the hot wind blows blinding sandstorms from the desert, the gods are angry. If you look in the corner, meet the gods. The four, four most important gods were Isis, Seth, Horus, and Ra, who was their king. Seth is evil, but most gods are only dangerous if offended. They must be worshiped properly. How do you know when the gods are angry? The Nile doesn't rise enough at flood time, so crops can't grow and people starve. Or swarms of locusts, flying insects that glob, gobble up crops, descend on the fields and ruin the harvest. Or a crocodile might tip your boat or you're fishing on the Nile. That's the end of you. Temple offerings. You can enter a temple only as far as the forecourt to put gifts on the rows of offering tables. Handy hint. Ask a scribe to write a prayer to the gods for you on a tablet and take it to the temple. To make sure they listen, draw ears on it. Off-color days. It is not unusual for pyramid workers to be involved in serious accidents, so take care. It isn't enough just to be careful. You have to protect yourself against the evil spirits who cause such things. Some days of the years are very unlucky, when it is believed evil forces are particularly strong. These dates are listed on the calendar, so remember to check. One of those days, it is best to avoid so like on those days, it is best to avoid bathing, making a journey, killing an ox, a goat, or a duck, lighting a fire in the house, or eating anything that lives in water. Illnesses are caused by evil spirits too. So doctors prescribe spells as well as medicine. 
Here are some other misfortunes fortunes that can happen. Broken limbs. If you don't, if you break a leg, don't worry. Ancient Egyptian doctors are good at setting fractures. Constant cough. Lung diseases are common. You'll probably get them from sand. Blindness is due to a common disease now known as trichoma. It means you can no longer earn a living except perhaps as a musician. Parasitic worms are caught from polluted water. These are unwelcome guests. Some live in your limbs. Catch an end and wind it out. Ouch. Watch where you put your feet. Scorpions live under stones, have a ferocious sting. Toothache? Apart from pulling out the tooth, there's nothing to be done. You just have to suffer. Suffer. Top is your, the top is your handy hint. Always carry an amulet. A lucky charm. This one re representing the eye of the sun god Ra keeps away sickness and misfortune. Wrapping up the Pharaoh. To have any chance of an afterlife, you must arrange to have your body preserved when you die. If it decays, your spirit will perish. In the case of the Pharaoh, these arrangements are important because the well-being of Egypt relies on his union with the gods. So if you find yourself in the embalmer's workshop, helping to turn smelly bodies into impressive looking, sweet smelling mummies. Don't complain that the job is messy and makes you sick. Remember, it is also a sacred process. The head of Bulmer wears the mask of Ambus, the god of the dead, and recites appropriate spells. So here are the steps to preserving the Pharaoh. Dry the body out completely by leaving it packed in natrin, a type of salt for 40 days. Remove the brain through the nose. Open the body, take out the insides, and fill it with sweet-smelling spices. Any missing pieces should be replaced with wood or a wad of cloth. It won't show under the layers of linen wrappings. Lucky amulets are bound in wrappings, and the mummy is completed by a face mask portraying the person within. Handy hint, don't throw any body parts away. Their owners will need them later. Store liver, intestines, stomach, and lungs separately in four jars. The pyramid is finished. The moment has come. The pharaoh is dead and his pyramid, built with the gleaming rocks of white limestone, is ready to receive him. Years of, work, sorry, years of work by thousands of people, skilled and unskilled, have gone into its making. It will be his body's everlasting home. Sacred rites performed by the temple priest daily will keep his spirit alive forever. Pharaoh's coffin is carried there in a ceremonial boat, accompanied by priests, courtiers, and professional mourners who wail loudly to express the people's grief at the loss of their ruler. Saying farewell to the Pharaoh. Mounted on a sledge, the coffin is dragged along the causeway that leads from the river to the pyramid. A procession following behind bears all sorts of costly objects that will go into the pyramid for the pharaoh to use in the afterlife. At the pyramid's entrance, priests perform a ceremony that magically, magically reawakens the dead pharaoh's senses. In the burial chamber, the priests lower the coffin into the esophagus, a distant set and massive stone laid in place. The pyramid is sealed with giant stone slabs dropped into place by the last people to leave. Finally, a new period to build. Don't count on getting a break. The new pharaoh wants work started on his at once. Here's a handy hint. Cover the pyramid entrance with casing blocks to baffle thieves seeking to steal the riches buried with the pharaoh. Sum it up. What work would you want to do when building a pyramid? What job would you want to avoid when building a pyramid? Did your thoughts change as you read the book? and looked at the different jobs. Finally, why were the pyramids built? The pyramids were built to be tombs for the pharaohs. Thank you for joining me on Learn at Home with VIA. Stay tuned for more learning activities about pyramids. <music>